Welcome to Reimagining Liberty, Project of the Unpopulist. I'm Aaron Ross Powell, and this is a show about the emancipatory and cosmopolitan case for radical social, political, and economic freedom. The ongoing moral panic and sweeping legislative changes aimed at trans people aren't just a tremendous assault on the liberty, autonomy, and dignity of peaceful Americans owed the space to live their lives as they choose. They're also the latest example of the way ideological ideas about traditional and natural gender roles have long been a tool authoritarians use to justify and maintain social and political control. To talk about these critical issues and what we can do about them, I'm joined by Jillian Brandstetter, a communications strategist at the ACLU's Women's Rights Project and LGBTQ and HIV Project. Can you give us a sense of how bad things have gotten in terms of the contemporary moral panic about trans people and trans identities? Sure. I think a good place to start is where uh, trans people uh, came into this current political moment. Um, So my first job here in D.C. and really sort of my first professional, the first time I was paid for trans advocacy, um, I joined the National Center for Transgender Equality uh, during the Trump administration, and the National Center for Transgender Equality administers this thing called the U.S. Transgender Survey, and it's kind of like the transgender census. And if you know anything about data gathering, particularly amongst minority populations, it's enormously difficult. So in 2015, 2016, they got 27,000 trans folks together to answer a survey about their Uh, living conditions, their economic conditions, their social conditions, to get a sense of what is the state of trans people in this country. And what they found was what most folks knew just by sort of talking with trans people, um, but to have hard numbers on was uh, enormously important for legislative and advocacy efforts. Uh, And what they found was that trans people are twice as likely to live in poverty. They're three times as likely to be unemployed. Uh, One in three have been homeless in their lifetime. One in eight have been homeless in the last year. Uh, They're four times as likely to experience violence. They're overrepresented in our nation's prisons, in our nation's juvenile detention systems, in our nation's foster care system, in our nation's homeless shelters, um, and face broad discrimination across functionally every area of their life, from healthcare to education to the workplace to their own homes. So, uh, you know, trans people weren't doing well before all the things you're now seeing in the news started. Um, The things you're now seeing in the news, uh, to pick an origin point, um, started to spike around 2020. Um, Obviously, there's a far older uh, origin point you can go to as part of uh, the role of gender panics and politics and things like that. But as far as this current wave goes... Um, what happened in 2020 is the Supreme Court heard a case called Bostock v. Clayton County. And this was a trio of cases the Supreme Court heard asking whether uh, discrimination against somebody on the basis of their sexual orientation or their gender identity is sex discrimination and therefore prohibited by sex non-discrimination laws, such as the Civil Rights Act, which governs uh, sex discrimination in employment. And the ACLU leading a case uh, featuring... Uh, Amy Stevens, who was a transgender woman in her 50s, who was uh, fired from a funeral home uh, that she worked from in Michigan, uh, we uh, successfully argued at the Supreme Court that, yes, when you discriminate against somebody because they are gay or because they are transgender or on the basis of their sexual orientation, on the basis of their gender identity, um, you are dis- inherently judging them based on their sex, based on their physical sex. And you are assessing that they are failing to conform to your standards and your expectations for them, and therefore discriminating against them. Uh, We won this case 6-3 from the Supreme Court. This was post-Gorsuch, post-Kavanaugh, pre-Barrett, but all the same, uh, a 6-3 majority, I think was even better than a lot of folks on our side thought uh, we could do with that court. Uh, The conservative legal movement greeted this as an apocalyptic event. You had folks like Josh Hawley and Ted Cruz saying that this was the end of the conservative legal movement. Because if you couldn't fire a trans person because they're trans, that therefore would contradict all of the work that the conservative legal movement has done. Um, It's right after that uh, case, which I think got swamped by the news because it happened in June of 2020, which folks might remember was a busy month. And uh, 
it was right after that in 2021 and then in 2022 and then right into 2023 that we see the uh, number of legislative efforts to restrict transgender people begin to double every year. It's a little over 100 in 2021. It's a little over 200 in 2022. And now in 2023, we're nearly 500 pieces of legislation that have been introduced in state houses, squarely targeting queer folks broadly, but mostly transgender people and mostly transgender youth. Um, there's very few areas of a transgender person's life that is not touched by this current slate uh, legislative actions. I think the bills that were just signed by uh, Ron DeSantis in Florida are pretty instructive here. He signed a bill outlawing trans people from using the restroom most consistent with their gender identity, threatening them with criminal penalty if they're caught using the wrong restroom. Uh, he signed a bill banning gender affirming care for transgender youth and in fact threatening to remove transgender youth, not just from uh, not just remove youth who are transgender from homes that affirm them in that trans identity, but to I uh, make it so that if anyone in the same household has access to medical transition, that thereby makes them a cause of threat in a child custody investigation. So basically threatening to uh, not just remove trans youth from their parents, but to remove youth from trans parents as well. Um, this uh, models what we saw in Texas last year, where not through statute, but seemingly through edict, uh, Greg Abbott, the governor of Texas, and uh, Ken Paxton, the attorney general of Texas, and my personal arch nemesis, uh, issued an edict. Uh, well, they issued a directive to the state's uh, child welfare agency, telling them to begin investigating uh, any child who is uh, thought to or known to have access gender affirming care. This is, remains a terror looming over the lives of thousands of families in Texas. The ACLU has filed two lawsuits to block this. Um, and we've won in court on behalf of our plaintiffs and behalf of uh, uh, one of our plaintiffs, which was PFLAC National, a great uh, organization which works to support the parents of queer youth. Um, so uh, by and large, this is uh, blocked in courts. Um, and we know that most cases have been opened, have been closed, the folks fully exonerated. Um, and we know that the uh, child welfare agency itself, uh, and if you know anything about these child welfare agencies, they are full of underpaid staff. Uh, the average lifespan of a social worker in one of these agencies is about six months. Um, they've seen uh, over 2,000 people leave the agency just in the years since that's been issued. So Rod DeSanta saw all that and said, sign me up. Um, and signed a bill just earlier this week that will uh, functionally seek to do the same thing. Um, there are, of course, uh, we are now at, but it's not just in Florida, obviously, we are now at, uh, I think it's over 15 states that have banned gender affirming care for transgender youth. We've seen uh, the attacks on care for transgender youth take a few different forms, some judicial, some uh, extrajudicial, some outright violent. Uh, we have, of course, seen a string of bomb threats entered into children's hospitals like Boston Children's Hospital and Vanderbilt University Hospital in Tennessee uh, because they work with transgender youth. We've seen the state of Oklahoma threaten to defund uh, the state's largest healthcare network if they did not uh, shut down their gender clinic, of course, forced into a opposition they did. Um, and we've seen in Missouri, where the state's attorney general, again, seemingly through edict, attempted to use the state's consumer protection laws to put uh, to enforce a long list of requirements that would functionally ban gender affirming care, not just for transgender youth, but for transgender people of any age. Notably, the attorney general actually just a few days ago rescinded that order after the state legislator banned care for transgender youth, making them, I think, the 18th state where that's done. Um, this is on top of, uh, you know, these, this political panic, um, is on top of a, a moral panic, um, one that is being waged and stoked by right wing media, one that is, uh, attempting to portray trans people and anyone who supports us as a threat, as a danger, as a contagion. Um, and it is, uh, you know, it really is reshaping transgender life across this country. Um, people are very concerned for themselves. They're very concerned for their loved ones. Uh, people are having to pick up stakes and, and leave states uh, if they can. Um, and uh, folks who, who do stay are having to help folks survive what is, um, you know, I think if this were uh, 
if any person had this done to them, they would recognize it for the kind of authoritarian push that it is. Um, and it's, I, uh, you know, I'm finding it uh, interesting who's seemingly willing to tolerate this massive expansion of the state in the name of repressing a marginalized minority. Yes, that last point is my, like, I think one of the things that makes me saddest about watching what's happening. I mean, the the act, the effect, like these laws, this is horrific stuff, um, and. And that it's happening to this, as you said, like an already marginalized and often suffering minority um, is absolutely terrible. But when it's coupled with people who really ought to know better, like just kind of going along with it, like people who were a, a lot of people who are like at the forefront of the movement for gay rights um, and ought to recognize how much this parallels like the their threat to our children and their you know social contagions and all of this kind of language that mirrors what we saw in in the struggles for gay rights but then they just kind of are going along with it or downplaying it or ignoring it is really distressing because Trans people need allies right now, and a lot of people who ought to be their allies are either buying into the moral panic or, at the very least, just looking the other way. Um, and and that ties into a lot of some a lot of the writing that you have done lately, or um, the threads that you have posted on Blue Sky, um, are are about how much this isn't this isn't just about this. Like that's I think what's also really distressing is that this moral panic is about a broader movement towards authoritarianism and it's kind of a classic authoritarian or often fascist playbook move to begin with striking against minorities and particularly along gender things so can you talk a bit about the role that gender norms play in this movement more broadly and why it is that so many on the authoritarian right seem so obsessed with what is properly masculine, what is properly feminism and those roles. And they're so incensed by what they see as like boundary transgressions. Sure. So um, I think it's helpful to understand gender as a list of rules. Uh, and they are rules that you both follow and you enforce. Um, you know, uh, if you've read anything about trans folks or you know trans folks in your life, you may have come across the phrase of being assigned a gender at birth, right? Um, so I'm a transgender woman, but I was assigned male at birth. You are a cisgender man, so you were assigned male at birth, right? Um, but really that assignment happens across the whole span of your life. And it structures so much of your life from the point of birth, uh, from cradle to grave, really. Um, and it structures how you move through the world. It structures the assumptions you make about people. It uh, structures your, your hopes and your fears. It structures your goals for your life. And for, uh, you know, an authoritarian personality that is very eager for rules to enforce is very eager to instill in people a sense of fear um, of the or, uh, of the strange uh, of the non-conforming. Gender's this very useful set of tools that are sort of already built for you. Um, they're sort of just lying around, and you just have to encourage people to pick them up and tighten the screws as to who is actually meeting your expectations and who is actually meeting the standards that you have for folks around you. And I frame it that way because I think sometimes uh, the, you know, Michael Knowles, who's this far right podcaster uh, from the Daily Wire, he stood on the stage at CPAC um, and he got a bunch of headlines because he said, we must eradicate transgenderism from public life entirely, right? Um, and I think it's, uh, you know, a lot of people's reaction to this was to say, well, that's, you know, explicitly uh, eliminationist rhetoric. That's explicitly genocidal rhetoric. And his response was to say, no, I didn't say transgender people. I said transgenderism, which is a bit like saying I didn't say Jewish people. I said Judaism. Um, 
And, but uh, his sort of stretch, his efforts to stretch it from just this a small group of people who call themselves transgender uh, to this vision of an ideology that must be eradicated, right? Um, and really transgenderism has a much older cousin in the word gender ideology, uh, which is, you know, more commonly heard from Viktor Orban and Vladimir Putin and Jair Bolsonaro and sort of, uh, you know, authoritarians around the world. Um, by sort of defining the enemy as an ideology, as opposed to just a singular group of people, um, I think that's actually scarier because what it suggests is what they have in their crosshairs is not simply this small group of people who call themselves transgender, but is a specific vision of how people can or should navigate gender norms, how people can or should navigate uh, these rules that I was describing earlier, right? And we can talk about the origins of those rules and their relationship to reproductive labor and, and everything else, right? Um, but, uh, to folks who are looking to, um, construct a very rigid set of scripts that they want people's lives to follow because gender is already a script, which so many of us follow because gender is already a script that we judge others for failing to follow. It presents this very natural tool for them. And if you listen to their rhetoric and you listen to their focus, their focus is not simply just trans people. Trans people are the main character in their nightmares, don't get me wrong. But there is a reason that trans people are now having our healthcare criminalized by the same legal movement that just is criminalizing abortion, right? We're now seeing them unite those two causes in even tighter ways. We just saw that in Nebraska, right? Where they had a ban on gender affirming care and they wanted to make a vote on a abortion ban easier. So they added the abortion ban as an amendment to the ban on gender affirming care to pass it through the legislator. The hope being that you will be so afraid of trans people's health care and trans youth health care specifically that you won't mind having abortion banned, right? They tried this in Michigan against a, an abortion ballot initiative. And they tried and they're trying this in Ohio uh, against the abortion ballot initiative as well. Um, it failed in Michigan, so I'm not sure why they're trying in Ohio. But, um, And the hope is that you will be so afraid of someone else's freedom that you won't mind sacrificing your own. So if you can create this sort of tear and this nightmare out of somebody else's freedom, then you can justify any level of restriction against that freedom with the you know, paper tiger promise that it will never be turned against the very people you're talking to. You mentioned that, um, you know, there are folks who are seeing these same attacks and have uh, seen them before in the, you know, in the gay rights movement, and now are, are either not taking these ones focus on trans people seriously, or uh, at, at their worst, are sort of giving error to these complaints and attempting to, to legitimize them. Um, I think it's important to, there's a long tradition in American history of tolerating abusive systems and then suddenly being surprised when they're turned against you, right? Um, and there's a lot of very, you know, occasionally I think naive wondering of like, when is authoritarianism going to come to the United States, right? You saw this after Trump and you saw Sinclair Lewis and George Orwell and Hannah Arendt sort of shoot to the top of bestseller list and like book clubs and things like this, right? It's like, could it happen here, right? Um, and what they're envisioning is this vision of like classical European fascism, Mussolini and Hitler and, uh, and Stalin to that extent. And they're, um, and in so doing, they're sort of erasing what the origin point of those fascist movements were. They looked and modeled so much of their policies, including, you know, their ugliest genocidal policies on the U.S.'s own racial caste system, right? Like Germany was sending researchers into the Jim Crow South to learn how to oppress a minority. And I think, you know, when you hear people ask, like, when will this sort of classical European authoritarian liberal anti-democratic fascism arrived in the United States. Um, it's a country that has 
uh, the world's largest prison population uh, that has, you know, seemingly extrajudicial killings by police, uh, where apparently even vigilante citizens will be empowered to murder undesirables on the subway. Um, I think there's a, you know, it seems to me absurd to ask, oh, when will authoritarianism come here? When it seems to already be here, it's just unevenly distributed. It's just targeted against very specific groups. It's targeted at Black people. It's targeted at immigrants, right? And, you know, I think a lot of uh, trans people, and particularly my, my fellow white trans people, uh, got an awakening to this uh, from that Texas order that I mentioned earlier, um, where the state was literally commanding agents to go and take children away from families. It sounds classically authoritarian, right? Uh, Vladimir Putin was just charged for, for with human rights crimes in The Hague because uh, his troops have stolen over 200,000 children out of Ukraine, right? And sent them to re-education camps. Um, the United States removes more children from their families than any other country on earth. We remove 500,000 children from their families every single year. And as researchers like Dorothy Roberts have shown, uh, the vast majority of those cases, upwards of 90% of them, are not in instances of physical abuse where somebody might suggest it's justified. It's usually the consequences of poverty. It's usually need, right? And instead of supporting these families, instead of giving them the support they need to uh, keep their children healthy and to help them thrive, they're surveilled, they're criminalized, they're police. Um, this is overwhelmingly Black families. This is overwhelmingly Indigenous families. And, you know, child removal is not a particularly new or novel policy in American life when we look to what happens at the border, right? And in, including under this administration, when we look at, you know, the, the legacy of uh, Indian schools, right? And this removal of children from indigenous tribes and their forced assimilation into Western cultures, including, by the way, the, er the erasure of indigenous two-spirit uh, gender identities. Uh, you certainly see this across the history of chattel slavery, right? Um, so these systems, I think, a lot of folks tolerated. And then the moment that their mandate was expanded to suddenly include trans youth, trans youth, by the way, of course, were already overrepresented in the nation's foster care system. But the moment that mandate was explicitly expanded, then suddenly, then suddenly it seemed shockingly authoritarian, right? And they're not wrong in being appalled at that expansion, they're wrong in the silence that they had towards those systems in the first place, towards those policies in the first place. In the same way that, um, I, you know, if I, well, never mind. I was going to go into hypotheticals, but you, you get the idea. <laughs> yeah. You had said, though, that the way that gender can function as a tool for this kind of social and or political control is that it's it gives us this set of rules like it's it it's an imposed set of rules and then we can basically on the one hand punish people who transgress those rules and on the other hand kind of frighten people about those transgressions to get them more willing to allow us to punish and exert control but you've mentioned so you mentioned poverty which is essentially a form of class, and class has its own rules. We have, you know, there those exist and those are imposed. We have rules based on national origin. So, you know, if you if you're one of us, you're one of the citizens, a certain set of rules applies. And if you're not, you come from somewhere else, your language is different, a different set of rules applies. There are all these different structures that would seem to be analogous to gender. So why, why is gender the one right now? Like why does it seem to be the one that that the right in some extent like intentionally latched onto? This is the Chris Rufo, like being very explicit about I am going to stir up resentments about this stuff in order to accomplish things. But why does gender specifically have so much purchase now, but not other kinds of trans border transgressions? Well, I think uh, the gender panic is threaded alongside and within, I mean, just to point to the ones you selected, I mean, 
um, the uh, justification of the murder of Jordan Neely is a panic about transgression of a class and racial order, right? And the panic over the homeless and shoplifting in San Francisco, right? Uh, Banco Brown, a 24-year-old transgender man, was shot by an armed Walgreens security guard uh, who faced no charges from the DA um, because he supposedly shoplifted from this Walgreens uh, just all of two weeks ago. Um, You know, those are, I think, paired um, with the gender panic. And of course, you know, watch any primetime hour on Fox News and you're likely to see those right next to panic about migrants at the border and so, but, you know, and sort of, so I think uh, this idea of like these transgressors of a perceived status quo, which are portrayed as threats to uh, the status of their supporters, right? Um, I think they're, they're threaded throughout. What I think separates gender specifically um, is that Gender as a set of rules governs, uh, you know, most conversations about gender are really a conversation about work, right? Um, I think there is a, a gap in understanding where gender is sort of, you know, it's how you dress, it's how you talk, it's the name you go by, it's pronouns, things like this, right? Um, but the reason that gender is sort of enforced against folks, right, the reason that the state or markets or whatever else might find it useful as a tool um, to construct and govern people's lives um, is because they can sort of mystify it and naturalize it behind uh, your reproductive capacity and therefore your perceived uh, or actual reproductive labor. Um, Reproductive labor, uh, I am trying to think of the easiest way to define it, Um, but it's basically the work that is done to support um, productive labor, cap- think capitalist labor, going to a factory every day, going to an office every day, whatever the case may be, right? Um, so reproductive labor is usually child rearing, it's caregiving, it's childbirth, it's gestating, it's um, housework, right? And all those categories of work that I just described uh, are extremely undervalued. They're, ex- you know, I when I worked at the National Women's Law Center, I worked for their childcare portfolio, um, and I, one of the things that we were trying to do was not just, I, uh, you know, so much of the conversation around childcare builds it as a product, but we were trying to make clear that this is a service, right, paid by a marginalized workforce. Um, childcare workers are more than ninety percent women, and they make on average about eleven dollars an hour uh, for enormously difficult work. Um, the overhead of childcare businesses is extremely thin. So when the pandemic started, uh, you saw this massive flood of childcare centers close. And uh, at many of which have still not reopened. Um, and one of the ways that uh, child care is devalued is that it's presumed to be this natural inborn gift of women, right? That it's supposed to be coming from the body, that there's some biologically determinist uh, means that makes certain people better at child care than others. And Therefore, that helps them devalue that form of labor because that labor is necessarily must be either affordable, cheap or free um, in order to sort of extract value from other workers. I don't know if I'm making any sense. Um, And I think um, because it gets so because gender gets so mystified behind the language of what is natural, what is biological. it makes it easier to suggest that, well, no, I'm just simply defending reality, right? Um, The funny thing about reality is that it doesn't need defending. Um, Reality is, right? Um, And, you know, there's this mindset that I see in a lot of the right and in uh, a lot of the politicians passing these bills, banning abortion or targeting trans folks of, uh, well, I'm defending biology and I'm uh, defending what's natural. Um, but if your vision of quote unquote biological gender requires a massive surveillance state and uh, the threat of enforcement by the state, it's probably not that biological to begin with. 
it seems that you're more explicitly admitting that you are constructing identities, that you are trying to pressure folks into the desired channels. And across, you know, uh, the conservative religious movement, um, across, you know, conservative and, and neoliberal econo- uh, 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 economists, um, the viewpoint is that what you should be aspiring to is this very heteronormative vision of the nuclear family, that there are caregivers and there are breadwinners and those are biologically determined and never between them shall they meet, right? And when I somebody who is perceived to be a caregiver, somebody who is born with a uterus, decides to take a different path in their life, whether that's being transgender, whether that's never having children, uh, whether that's never getting married, right? Um, there are all these sorts of pinpoints, there are all these sorts of uh, sticks and no carrot to try and push them back into that role. And part of that is, I think, you know, banning abortion, banning queer identities, all of this is to make it seem impossible uh, to pursue any other life outside of this very narrow arrangement of productive and reproductive labor. And if you can make all of the other paths seem impossible or doomed to fail or unlivable, um, then you can sort of retain the idea that this heteronormative state, that this very bucolic vision of the nuclear family is the natural state. It's the way it's always been. This is how it should be, right? And a better way of understanding this is sort of like female subservience versus male dominance. Like, And I think one of the things that, um, you know, I'm seeing in Josh Hawley's book tour, uh, he's touring this book about masculinity and the, the, the failings of masculinity, right? Or in Donald Trump, uh, uh, going on this grotesque town hall on CNN where, um, he's getting a a applaud and laughter for mocking the woman he was just, uh, convicted of sexually abusing. Um, he, uh, you know, those are visions of male dominance, of a very rigid vision of masculinity. And what I think they're promising their uh, their followers is that they can sort of return them to that masculine dominance or to their female followers to at least the sense of stability, right? This idea that like, well, at least you're safe and at least you're sort of cared for under this role of sort of female submission. And I think most would sort of reject that, right? I think when you talk to a lot of uh, conservative women, um, they speak of pride of being women, right? They speak in this sense that it's like, no, it's just, I just, I, um, I'm just defending this very narrow path. I'm not denying my womanhood because they're believing that the roles that they're being assigned to or the roles that they're, they, they may very well honestly be pursuing of their own volition, are rooted in their biology rather than in their own sense of themselves and in their their own willingness or lack thereof to consent. So you, you mentioned that the work that was traditionally seen as feminine, so child care stuff was undervalued. And I think there's there's often a corresponding like perception of overvaluing of other kinds of work that are seen as traditionally masculine. Um, there's you you mentioned that this this naturalness of the roles part baked into that is a view of dominance, that the the traditionally male gender roles should be dominant over the traditionally female gender roles. And all of this just is bound up in status. Like so earlier on we were talking about this is about social control and boundary transgressions as a way to manipulate social control and so on. But it seems like so much of the through line of the really awful politics that we have seen and really awful social movements we've seen from the right are fundamentally about status has shifted. Status is always shifting. The history of human of humanity is rising and lowering of status of different groups and so on. But you have this sense that there's there were a lot of people – mostly men, kind of like mediocre men who assumed that they were owed a level of status because of the the simple fact that they were men 
And so at least they were better than the than women. They were better than trans people. They were better, you know, sometimes there's a white racial there's a white cultural anxiety that's bound up in this. Um, they were owed respect. This was kind of my reaction to the like the Harper's letter about free speech was there were a lot of people on there who there were people on there who had legitimately been like unjustly criticized and so on. But there were a lot of people who had not been canceled. It was just that suddenly they were being criticized by people they saw as socially beneath them um, and they didn't like it. And so, so there was a relative shift in status and that just seems to be so central to so much of this. Like we don't like egalitarianism because egalitarianism is a, a denial of excellence. But the people who typically are making that kind of argument are people who don't have a lot of excellence. Excellence tends to get recognized, right? It's just like, but they think that like just kind of being Western and being white and being male is a form of excellence that's being denied. Like that just seems to be so – this. That status, those status games seem so central to so much of this and so much of like the anger at trans, trans people were very low social status, but now their status is rising. And one way we indicate that is like, you should respect their use of pronouns. But no, I want to sneer at them for, you know, like, because I want them to be lower status. Like this just seems so central to what's going on. Yeah. Um, so I've been fascinated watching the um, fallout from uh the uh, I I believe divorce of uh Steven Crowder uh from his wife. Steven Crowder is this, this far right YouTuber. Um I don't know that I uh know much about his politics, but looking around they they seem pretty predictable. Um and he was billed to maybe replace Tucker Carlson on Fox News. Let's 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 put it that way. Um and uh this uh for folks that don't know this uh surveillance video from his home came out as part of the uh, proceedings where he's um, berating his pregnant wife and screaming at her and being, you know, very clearly emotionally abusive. And uh, one of the things he keeps doing in that video is he keeps using the phrase wifely duties. And he keeps saying that she's failing her wifely duties. And I don't know the full context of the video, but best I can tell it's that he, she's not emotionally placating him, right? She's not validating him, right? Um, and I think, uh, I find that very indicative, right? Um, that there's this idea that they're entitled to a sense of validation. They're entitled to, uh, this, you know, uh, what is labor, emotional labor, which fits under that category of reproductive labor I was talking about earlier and any effort that I, you know, denies them that even if it's just somebody else exerting their own autonomy as a person, uh, needs to be squashed immediately. So that conversation then on the right from the wake of that video and from his divorce then immediately turned to, well, why do we even allow for no-fault divorce, right? And there's now a bill in the state of South Dakota attempting to abolish no-fault divorce, right? Um, and I, you know, I think similarly, there's a lawsuit that was filed in the state of Texas um, under that uh, SB8, that states, uh, you know, bounty abortion law. Um, and it was uh, filed by the ex-husband of a woman who had obtained a medication abortion against her and her three friends. And it was, uh, you know, I think um, reproductive coercion lies at the heart of a lot of domestic abuse cases, um, it's one reason why abortion should be legal and available, right? It is, you know, the number one cause of death during pregnancy is homicide. Um, and I think, uh, you know, Kate Mann and others have, have written very well that, like, this violence that's exerted against, that domestic violence is most often preceded by um, usually a, a wife re or, or a girlfriend rejecting um the role to which her male partner believes she's entitled right um and this is one of many reasons why uh trans people like as much as we talk about sort of hate violence and this like the number one category of violence that trans people experience is domestic violence right um i think i 
as much as sort of easy, you know, um, I mentioned Kate Mann and in her book Down Girl, she, she uh, puts forward this idea of the quote naive conception of misogyny, the idea that misogyny is simply hatred of women because they are women, right? Um, that it has some irrational hatred in somebody's heart, right? Um, but it's more often directed at women who are perceived as breaking outside of these categories, right? And to your point, threatening this sort of sense of male status. And, you know, I think transphobia too has a sort of naive conception where it's, well, they just hate trans people because they're trans and, you know, no hate and we're going to oppose this, right? Um, and that's not wrong, right? Like that kind of hatred does exist, but it's just a very narrow lens for explaining what's actually happening, uh, which is that they're very upset that somebody could, uh, you know, somebody's own autonomy would come before their entitlement to uh, that person's emotional labor or reproductive labor or whatever the case may be. You mentioned that there uh, is an overlap here with um, white racial anxiety. And I think it's important to pull that out. Um, it was about a year ago that I was getting drinks with some friends and I got a text from another friend uh, showing me screenshots of what were clearly like deranged, racist, anti-Semitic memes. And uh, what was alarming about these outside of just being deranged and racist and anti-Semitic um, was that they happened to feature uh, colleagues of mine and friends of mine um, within the queer rights movement. And I, the person who texted them to me told me that these were found inside the a manifesto that was written by the young man who walked into a Topps grocery store in Buffalo, New York and shot nine people, most of them black. Folks might remember that after that incident, there was a lot of talk of what was called the great replacement theory. And the great replacement theory, which has extremely old echoes, has lots of echoes across Europe, right? Um, it's this idea that there is a powerful, usually Jewish cabal uh, who are, you know, George Soros often gets cast in this role, who are paying off migrants uh, so that they will flood into Europe and the United States in order to change the racial demographics. Um, but if you look at their conspiracy theories, like the ones that uh, my friends are being featured in, they are, that's really only half the story. The other half of the story is that they are um, that this secretive cabal is also trying to minimize white birth rates. And according to this young man who went into a Topps grocery store and killed nine black people, he was doing this partially to make up for the losses of uh, white youth who were led towards gender affirming care and then supposedly rendered infertile. And if you look across sort of, you know, uh, the New York Times did this deep dive into, after that shooting, did this deep dive into the monologues of Tucker Carlson to look at sort of how often he was promoting the Great Replacement Theory. And uh, they found over 200 instances where he was making this direct correlation to changing gender norms. Because they view gender as an arrangement of labor. And if they want to maintain the sort of white dominance, they need as many white babies as possible. So they therefore need to naturalize, mystify, and enforce at the full, fullest extent of the law, the labor arrangement that gives them the most white babies. So they need to do things like ban abortion. They need to do things like ban birth control. They need to do things like ban no-fault divorce. And they certainly need to make it impossible for anyone to pursue a non-heterosexual identity. So what do we do about all of this? Because I think the takeaway from the last 45 minutes of our conversation is this isn't just a big problem. It is a lot of big problems interlinked that are feeding off of each other. And as you as you so well summarized at the very beginning, are are leading to a growing legal regime of really awful stuff 
that seems to be accelerating. So what's the what's the way forward as far as the immediate, you know, like obviously it's change hearts and minds in the long term, right? Like get people to be more accepting, to break down notions of what's traditional, what's natural, rethink how willing we are to let other people just kind of live their lives. Um, but in the shorter term, what what can we do to ameliorate, if not reverse, these this pretty bad situation? So uh, first, for our part uh, at the ACLU, um, you know, we are uh, just about weekly now uh, in qu- taking these states to court uh, for their efforts to, I mean, on, across a broad range of the topics we've been talking about, obviously, our reproductive uh, rights project um, has been incredibly busy over the course of the last year, uh, attempting to, you know, very much do harm reduction around the abortion bans that are being enacted. Um, we at the LGBT project uh, have, I mean, over the last few years have had actions in Arkansas against bans and gender affirming care and also in Texas and also now in Tennessee and Montana and Oklahoma and, uh, and where else? Uh, Indiana, uh, Missouri, Kentucky. Um, and you know, they're, they're keeping us busy, um, as they should be. Um, well, you know, um, uh, it would be worse if we were not busy in the face of such torrent is what I meant. Um, and, you know, um, the shape of the courts being what it is, I think a lot of people uh, can view that project with skepticism. Um, but I think similarly to, uh, you know, the sense of reality that we needed to have uh, after the Dobbs opinion every single day that somebody can uh, exert autonomy over their own body is a victory. Um, and part of the problem here in the trans rights space um, is that, like I said, we weren't doing all that well to begin with. And that is true, not just of the trans rights population, but it's also true of the trans rights movement. Um, You know, trans people are uh, incredible. They're uh, uh, willing to survive in the harshest conditions. Trans people have, uh, you know, survived every, uh, I, you know, trans people are older than Christianity or capitalism, uh, whereas culturally universal is music. Um, We are uh, far tougher than, you know, what, Matt Walsh, Ron DeSantis, come on. And I think um, part of what we're going to need to do is we, as trans people, is access that sense of resility, that sense of strength, and that sense of, uh, you know, holding on to each other. Um, But paired with that, we need cis people to get extremely loud um, and not just in, you know, their voices and in their own social spheres and, and in their own workplaces and things like that. Um, we need cis people to make sure that when they're fighting against efforts at their own autonomy and efforts at their own repression, um, they are not using ours as a bargaining chip. They are not seeing ours as baggage um, and they are not falling under the false belief that uh, they can simply repel the people who are furthest from that state of heteronormative privilege and then find a sense of security in their own um, because that is a loser's game. Thank you for listening to Reimagining Liberty. If you enjoy this show, please take a moment to rate and review it on Apple Podcasts. You can also join our Discord listener community and book club by following the link in the show notes. Reimagining Liberty is a project of the Unpopulist and is produced by Landry Ayers. 